So we're here to solve this Yajlin by Prasanna Sashadri called Empty Middle. I'm going to begin by just looking at the arrangement of the clues and seeing that, for instance, in this upper left corner, we've got a case where we can't shade at either of these two cells because it would isolate in the end. It's the same story down in the lower right. We can put these through. Uh, these zero clues actually feed a lot of the grid right at the start, and even the zero right clue is going to force this loop end uh, to turn and corner. Similar constraints based on this zero right clue. We can mark uh, some spaces which will have one of these two cells shaded, so the one up clue and the one down clue and these one left clues. Mark cells like this, um, also this from the one ups. This two left clue, we couldn't actually place a notation here. We'd form a, a deadly pattern. We're going to form a dead end in the grid if those get shaded. So instead we have to shade one of these two and one of those two. And I think this is a good set of notes in the grid as we move to the constraints that really will force the solve. One of the things to really see uh, more commonly, it, it, it will play out in three different places right now, is there are sometimes cells where when you shade them based on an end being diagonally adjacent to it, but now getting too many places it has to connect into, we're going to make a three-way junction. This cell here, diagonally adjacent to a shaded cell, now is forced to come to the left and also come up. If we looked at this cell, this cell diagonally adjacent to that would form a three-way junction. That's also no good. And uh, similarly, this cell diagonally to that is just symmetric to the one below would form those kind of junctions. So in three places in the grid, we've got a cell we can rule out based on how it would form an invalid pattern for Yagelin to be completed. This one on the right side is maybe easier because you can also see that you'd be closing off these loop ends, but to be shading in this interior grid, this one on the edge, and then this interior cell is the force uh, point at this stage of the puzzle. This shading on the rightmost column actually gives a little bit of a faster set of next steps. It's going to get these loop ends coming into the grid and coming to the right side of the grid. This one down clue is now complete. And so as we corner around these cells and mark them in the grid, we get this uh, pattern up top. We have a few deductions we can make in different spaces, but I'm going to start with one that's, that's pretty key, which is recognizing how these one left clues are going to be leading to a single end coming down this grid in some set of columns. And I think one thing I want uh, to kind of put into your intuition space when you're thinking about Yagellon is something about how shaded cells tend to have to go together in a particular way based on checkerboard parity. So one of the, and this may be the hardest way to do this in the center, but we're going to run into it again in the middle, is to recognize, for instance, if I shade this cell in green, um, the worst thing I can do down here is to shade another cell in green because it would end up with a channel the loop is going to come through that's got four blue and two green cells, and so you'll never be able to complete that in. You actually can grab you know, one more blue than overall green, but you can't grab two more blue than overall green. You have to have an equal number at the end of the day of green and blue for the whole loop through the whole grid. And so in doing that, the thing to see is when these are three rows apart like they are here, you're going to be shading this in the same column to get a green and a blue shaded. If these were actually like four or two rows apart, you would be shading an opposite uh, you know, if this clue are one above, you'd be shading the opposite. So you're getting this green and this blue, but again, you're leaving behind an equal number of the different colors. I'm not sure if that's sort of fully clear what I'm trying to get at, but it's a kind of constraint when you think about shadings that work together. These shadings are actually tightly tied together, and they have to be in opposite colors. And that opposite color constraint means they can't actually be in this first column here. They have to both be in the second column to be this green and this blue. That's one way to think through this. A different way to think through this different kind of logic entirely is to actually recognize we've got one loop end that's going to come down this channel and also one loop end that then has to come up this channel. And so this edge can't be crossed. You would isolate too few loop ends in this part of the grid. So instead down here, this loop end is going to come up and over. And there are actually only two cells left that this one up clue can come from. The one up can be shaded here uh, and that would just sort of naturally follow. Or if this, this clue was shading this cell, this loop end now can't ever reach back to the cell, and so this cell gets shaded. And so what you may have run into is that one of those two cells is what gets shaded, which means that all these cells are not shaded. And in particular, this then has to be uh, shaded off. Put this in the grid. You'll now come back to the stage where we can't shade this cell, but we talked through why before, but you can just see from the loop ends now, it's more obvious why the, the coloring parity would be an issue there. Get this into the grid. We now have really just two clues to think about. The two left we already notated in this one down. And the first thing from the one down is we can see that these two cells can't be marked because they would actually form a deadly pattern with a shaded cell just, just around it. We still need to think about how we get 
a valid set of shadings for, for this to across. And here it's not going to be that there are too many limited ways to cross over the sixth row. Um, sometimes you'll get a, a constraint based on a shading like this where you need to have just a single end go across. In this case, having two ends go across looks fine. So the option where we shade um, this cell and this cell would be okay. The option where we shade this cell and this cell would be okay based on just the ends. But what you should see is that if we come down and look below with the space of what we, we put in the grid, we've got six in blue and four in green. You'll see that this will never have a valid way the loop comes through it. We're not leaving enough cells of the right color to have an equal number as a loop goes through. For instance, you would leave one cell in blue with this, with this pattern. And if we come back and looked at the other one, um, here we have too many green and too few blue, so we'll always leave one of these green cells unused. And what that is saying in general is that where we've now got this tight space in the bottom of the grid, this 3x4 box, and we're shading two of those cells, we want to shade a blue and we want to shade a green. And the only way to shade those two colors is to shade the two extreme spots. And uh, that gives us for sure, actually, this is the last space for a one down. Get a shaded box here. We've got these coming across. We have this end coming in here. This cell can't be left and down. That would close off the loop. So it always comes up, and in coming up, it marks off the cell as unreachable. Comes to here, we've got two loop ends that dodge, and we finish the grid. So hopefully you got yourself through this puzzle by persona. You might have done it more by just trying some shadings and, and uh, seeing the consequences, why those things canceled out reasons. But really this coloring of, of either or, basically every other cell you, the loop travels to is of an opposite parity in a checkerboard sense. You learn things like why these two cells, when they're three rows apart, are going to be moving together in the same column because we need to shade opposite colors. And it's even why there's a key constraint in this two left in the grid. It may not be obvious right as you get started in thinking about it that all those three choices look valid. But when we really constrain just these eight cells below, we need to again get an equal number of um, similarly colored cells up above. And so you've got to color to far extremes to get two different colors, one blue and one green. And what you're doing and that's how you get to the end of this puzzle. So hopefully you're learning something through this week about some of these constraints that pop up in Yagilin and we'll see you again soon.